one of the things is if you want to look at processes is the possibility of the following consider a program where you compute pi and then you print something right but this function itself is going to take a really long time so the compute pi function is going to take a long time and you know the, the this process is never going to print out the class list uh, because compute pi would never finish right or it takes a long time to finish um, in which case it takes a long time to print out that but then in the meantime there are other things that you may want your program to do that that are useful right so your program may want uh, maybe compute the rect area of a rectangle right so in such cases the question is I want to access the variables in my program but I don't want to wait for some really long activity that the program is embarking on so there's one specific function that's going to take a really long time and I don't want to wait for it okay now that's so in order to achieve that is the use of threads so if you want to you know have have a really long operation that the program is going to do and you want to do other more useful things uh, then essentially you use threads. So the way this would work is different uh, APIs support different syntaxes in order to create a thread itself. But essentially, in the version of the program with threads, uh, you would you would have these create thread calls. Okay, what create thread does is similar to a fork, but at that point there's a separate uh, vessel of execution, a thread running that has access to all the variables, everything is shared, and one thread is running compute pi, while another thread is running print plus. So at this point you have main and then your thing splits into two. So one does the pi and the other one does the print. Right? And so um, these are really two separate things and create thread essentially starts uh, independent threads um, in the system. An example of this, uh, where it's quite useful, uh, a concrete example is a multi-threaded text editor. So essentially, you have one thread for handling all the keyboard input, another thread for handling all the GUI stuff, and then one for handling all the I/O. And the three threads closely collaborate and share data. So all your keystrokes need to appear on the screen, which means your GUI thread needs to be aware of them. And then when the when you hit save or anything, those things need to be flushed out of the disk, and so there's a lot of sharing between them, and which is why there are a lot of threads as opposed to processes. Another example could be a web browser where you have CSS um, and page layout on the screen itself, which is all your display stuff. Then you know, there's the XML part of your pro, your page, which is has all the data elements, uh, which is handled uh, by a separate thread. And then there are other possible components for handling things like tabbing and plugins and all that, which also run as a separate thread. Another example would be a database server uh, where you have multiple worker threads waiting, operating on the web page cache at the same time. And for each of the network connections, you possibly have a different worker thread. This is a you know reasonable concrete example of how a database server would be implemented. So you have a dispatcher thread and a worker thread. So the dispatcher thread essentially sits in a loop, gets the next request, and then hands off the work. Right? So it, it has, sometimes it may even pre uh, create the threads and have them ready. And all the, when they're ready, all they're doing is sitting in a loop, waiting for work. Um, once they get the work, then they look for the page. And if page is not in cache, then they're just going to uh, return the page. If the page is in the cache, then it um, they're going to return it from the cache itself. And so a single dispatcher hands out work to a fixed size pool of worker threads. Uh, this is because the alternative of spawning a uh, new thread for each request may result in a really large number of threads and it also incurs the uh, thread creation overhead for each request. Right? What if you have 100,000 requests appearing in a second? If you had already pre forked out 100,000 threads ahead of time, then they're sitting there waiting for real work, you get the work, you immediately start doing it. If you don't fork off the thread until you actually see the request, then every single time you have to bear the cost of the thread creation itself. In this case, it will be amortized over many requests. Normally, uh, pthreads is the um, generic system we'll be using. So 
I will put up a link on the blog um, of Google Groups uh, about the Pthread API. But in general, you have a thread creation, thread exit, similar to the fork, uh, sorry, similar to processes. This is exit. You have a join, which is similar to the wait call in the process. Uh, yield is an interesting one where essentially one of the threads is saying it's done with the CPU and another thread can run. Um, and then you have thread uh, attribute initialization, attribute destruction where an example of an attribute would be a specific scheduling policy. And we'll look at scheduling policies in a second. Uh, this is an example of a multi-threaded uh, program. And if you look at this program, uh, it's pretty hard to read. I would encourage you to go look at the slides. Um, essentially, what's happening here is you have a bunch of threads. The number of threads uh, created is equal to the hash defined number of threads, which is 10 here. And you iterate over a loop, and um, you start creating a separate thread for each. Um, so you create 10 threads, and you're sitting in a loop that it does 10 times. Okay, so each of these threads is going to do the print hello world function, right? And in the print hello world, you print hello world, and you also say greetings from the thread, right? And you print the thread ID. So if you look at this, you can get a whole bunch of things. You could get a hello world zero, followed by a hello world one, so on and so forth. Or you could get hello world zero, one, followed by hello world zero, so on and so forth, right? All possible sequences are likely. Because essentially there is no uh, rule on, as to what order these different threads run in. So that's one of the most important things um, that you got to remember when you have these threads. They are really separate entities. Uh, there is no control over what order they run in unless you explicitly specify uh, some way of coordinating them. Um, so the output really depends on the scheduling algorithm. Um, and the scheduling algorithm can make all kinds of choices of FIFO, which would mean these things are in sequence or it could be based on, I like thread five, so I'm gonna schedule it first. A scheduling algorithm is well within its rights to make such decisions. And in such cases, the output is quite unpredictable. So to summarize uh, this segment, uh, threads uh, are for concurrency and address spaces are for protection. Processes need both. Processes have at least one thread and they need address spaces to manage the stack heap and the code. And the concurrency is accomplished by multiplexing the CPU over time. So you have lots of different processes that want to run at the same time, then you time multiplex the CPU. Such context switching may either be voluntary, like yield or I.O. operations, or involuntary where you have alarm set up, such as a timer or other form of interrupts. Okay? And when you have a context switch, you got to save and restore um, either the PCB or the task control block, and restoring these are expensive not the primary expensive operation, but if you have address space, which is like when you have between, when you contact switch processes, that is an expensive operation, okay? And protection is accomplished by restricting accesses. Uh, virtual memory essentially isolate processes from each other, and protection is achieved by essentially making sure they don't trample upon each other and they really map to separate parts of the address space. And the next thing we look at in this segment is thread and process scheduling.